Are you excited about the Lord? Amen. Amen. I'm excited about Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to just leave that right there. And I'm going to read uh, this joke here. And I don't know. I think this joke's hilarious. I know some people, I'm trying to be nice when I say these things, but some people get religious. This joke's funny. Just laugh, okay? <laughs> and if you don't think it's funny, don't laugh. Scott, you're going to love it. I, mean, I know he is. I may have shared it with you. I don't remember if I did or not. But it's an absolutely hilarious joke. It's called high tech. And we live in a high tech society, right? Anyhow. And, you know, there's, in nationality, there's, there's like, you know, United States and Germany and France and all these countries there, you know, we're trying to outdo each other and all that kind of stuff. So I thought this joke was very funny. It's called High Tech. Three men, one German, one Japanese, and a redneck were sitting in a sauna. Suddenly there was a beeping sound. The German pressed his forearm and the, sounds, and the beep stopped. The others looked at him questionably. That was my uh, pager, he said. I have a microchip under the skin of my arm. A few minutes later, a phone rang. The Japanese fellow lifted his, the palm to his ear. When he had finished, he explained, that was my mobile phone. I have a microchip in my hand. The redneck feel, felt decidedly low-tech, but not to be outdone, he decided he had to do something just as impressive. He stepped out of the sauna and went to the bathroom. He returned with a piece of toilet paper hanging from his backside. <laughs> the others raised the, the eyebrows and stared at him. The redneck finally said, well, will you look at that? I'm getting a fax. <laughs> now that's funny that's hilarious I don't care who you are <laughs> Anyhow. you know this idea of God and, and relationship and that, I think God's laughing I think he thinks that's funny you know God gave us humor I'm not, into, I'm not trying to be crude or anything like that but that's hilarious that's too funny not to share with you. So. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Oh, where are we going to go? We got so much stuff to say and so little time to say it. In fact, I'm actually going to skip some of this just because um, it's just too much. Uh, in fact, the Lord gave me a message today, and this is how much I'm growing. Say growing. Um, I used to, if I would have got a message like I got this morning, I would have said, well, I got to share that today. That's awesome. And, and now I feel more self-restraint, and, so, and I believe it's a fruit of the Spirit that it will maybe be next week if the Lord allows me, because i got a couple of them in the cooker right now. And, uh, and so we'll see. And, and it's a really exciting message, it's, and I think I'm going to call it uh, Bit by the Antichrist. And so it's really, really a cool message, and, and, uh, but this one's a cool one too. Amen? <laughs> so we are going to finish the six uh, foundational doctrines of Jesus Christ today, because if your foundation's messed up, you're a mess. Amen? And most of the body of Christ has a messed up foundation. Amen? Amen. I'm not saying that in a condescending way. I'm saying that, that most of the body of Christ, the foundation is totally messed up. And if your foundation's messed up, what does it say in Psalm 11, verse 3? If the foundation's destroyed, what can the righteous do? Amen? Now, we're born again, and Jesus is our foundation. We're going to heaven, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. But you know, we, God wants heaven to start right here, before we go there physically, before we're, you know, we're in our glorified body, etc. God wants us to bring heaven to earth. That's been his will. That's why Jesus taught him to pray. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And see, and as I've said before that I believe the Lord put on my heart, most of, if not all, the misunderstandings in the body of Christ are rooted in the fact that people don't understand spirit, soul, and body. Amen. For example... Are you in the kingdom now or is the kingdom coming? Answer, both. You're in the kingdom now if you're born again. Amen? The kingdom's in you, John chapter, or excuse me, Luke chapter 17, 20 and 21, in many places. Christ in you, the hope of glory, etc., etc. There's many verses, but yet the kingdom in its fullness is coming. You're going to the kingdom, but you're in the kingdom. Amen? See, if you don't understand it, what part's in the kingdom? My spirit's in the kingdom. And the more I renew my mind to where my spirit's at, the more I manifest his life in this life. How many know that's God's desire? Amen? So we need to understand these things. The Bible says knowledge is easy to the person that has understanding, Proverbs 14, 6. The flip side of that two-sided coin is knowledge is difficult if you don't have understanding. And see, and most, of the, most people in the Bible were mixed up about many, many things. So let's get right into it for the sake of time. You know, I had a revelation this morning. I've got way too much material. <laughs> that sounds funny to you, 
But you know, if you've ever taught or ministered, there's always that fear that you'll run out of stuff. I know that sounds funny, but, but I'm telling you, it's, I'm on absolute overload. That's why I'm skipping a bunch, because we'll have to bring that somewhere else. If you get these things, you're, you're on the process of freedom. You're in the process of experiencing the freedom that you have in Christ. Amen? And that freedom isn't to go indulge the flesh. That's not freedom, that's bondage. Amen? Freedom is free to be everything that God's created us to be. Amen. That's freedom. And that doesn't come from the truth. It comes from knowing the truth, John chapter 8. That's what sets you free. Amen. Amen. This is the most exciting life in the world, being a Christian. You know that? It is exciting. Hebrews chapter 6, 1. I'm hoping to finish this last one today. <laughs> Red Sea Miracle, I hear you. All right. Therefore, leaving, I'm just going to do, this is going to be a quick review. You'll have to get previous teachings. Uh, you can go online. You can order the CDs, however, but you have to get previous teachings because I do not have time to camp on each one of these, but I'll, I'll mention each one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. What that means is going on, right? We don't stay, we don't build a foundation and keep building on it for 50 years. We got to build on the foundation, right? That's what it means. It doesn't mean to abandon the foundation, that's what religion does. Man's religion will teach you to abandon the foundation, watch this, of the doctrine not of God. Big difference. Wasn't well, Christ God? Yes, Christ is God. But it's the doctrine of Christ. What Jesus did. Amen. Anytime you put faith into what you're doing, it's a dead work. I put faith in what he's doing, which is my work, to get my faith into what he's done Amen. That's a better way to say it. All right. So we leave the principles or we move on from the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto, if you remember this, perfection. The Greek says, let us go on into the perfection. A singular noun preceded by a definite article, which means the perfection is Jesus. Let's go into the perfection that he's made available to us. Everybody got that? All right. Not laying again, implying it should be laid. Again means doing it over. <laughs> Not laying again. What? The foundation of repentance from dead works. Stop. I'm not going to camp here, but I'm going to say something. Repentance not from sin or sins, but dead works. You got that? Dead works are any work that you and I do in exchange for something that Jesus has already done. Now, some people hear this because they have a dead works mentality. Oh, I don't do nothing then. That's not repentance from dead works. Amen. You don't need to hear the new covenant and God still loves you. But if you don't hear the new covenant, you're very stupid. But God loves you stupid. <laughs> I'm saying that, you know, but it's the truth. You don't have to, but if you don't. See, you're always hearing something. Always, even from your own, your own conscience and your own mind. The new covenant is what we... See, and we need to repent. The word repent means, or repentance means to change your mind from dead works. Stop trying to merit what Jesus has already done. Just receive it and say, thank you. Amen. Amen. And if you'll receive it, it'll begin to change what you do. Glory to God. So we talked about repentance from dead works and a faith toward or literally upon God is what the Greek says. Until we repent of dead works, we have no faith in God. <clears throat> Our faith is still in us. Can anybody see that? There's a sequence and an order to these six doctrines and their foundation. Everybody say foundation. Until I repent of dead works and trusting in my own ability to merit anything from God, my faith will not be upon God. It'll be upon me. That's probably 95% of the body of Christ right there. Their faith is in what they're doing instead of what he's done. See, this fight, this good fight of faith is to get, that's a good fight of faith. Did you notice that? It's not the good fight of grace. Amen. Can you hear that? We fight to keep our faith in what Jesus has done and out of us. Oh, glory. All right. So repentance from dead works, then our faith will be upon God. Next verse. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands. I'm just mentioning two of them. Baptisms, we talked about Christian baptisms, right? Remember that? Has to do, and in the Old Testament, the cleansing, the carnal washings, 
Hebrews 9.10 had to do with the washing of the sacrifices. There was constant washings, which represented purity. Ever say purity. purity. And you're pure in Christ, amen? There, and, and, and we talked about the three Christian baptisms into the body of Christ, water baptism and baptism in the Holy Ghost. I'm not going over all that. I don't have that kind of time. But and, and, and when, you, when you recognize that you're clean, doctrine of baptisms, you'll have confidence to lay hands on people, lay hands on the sick, lay hands to impart blessing, whatever. You'll have confidence because you understand that you're clean in Jesus. Jesus said, now you are clean. John 15, verse 3, through the word which I have spoken to you. Don't worry, I'm going to slow down. I'm just reviewing. Okay? Okay, and of the doctrine of baptisms. And then last week we began talking about of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Everybody say resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now I'm going to bleep briefly, briefly, <laughs> briefly, I'll bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> no. I'm going to briefly review uh, the resurrection of the dead and then we're going to get right into eternal judgment. Now, I, I can't go over all this. There is a future resurrection coming, right? When you will receive a glorified body, say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. But there's also a current resurrection that I believe the Bible calls the first resurrection. That's where your spirit's at. If you're born again, your spirit's been raised and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse... That was a test. Six. Okay? Chapter 2, verse 6. I'm going to challenge you guys with that. You have the mind of Christ. Do you have to know the address on everything? No, but you can. Amen. Come up hither. Amen. God, amen. You have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. Where's that at, Joel? 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Good job. Amen. <laughs> amen. You have it. You have it. You know that. You can remember things. You know that. You have an amazing mind. It's the mind of Christ. But you can lean to that one or, or the other one. <laughs> All right. Of the doctrine of baptism, of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So we talked about the first resurrection. We've, if you're born again, your spirit's been raised and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's why Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, blessed and holy is he who takes his part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. What is the second death? All the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter, according to Romans 8, 6 from the Amplified Bible. I'm going to give you a couple more verses, or one more here, and then we'll get into eternal judgments. And then I'll slow down. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. There's, how many know there's seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, right? There's seven churches. I know I'm holding up five fingers, but... <laughs> <there's>, <laughs> and the second one is Smyrna. Smyrna, I think, is modern-day Ishmar in uh, Turkey, the area of Asia Minor. Uh, greatly persecuted church. They were massively persecuted. In fact, uh, history tells us that the bishop Polycarp was martyred in uh, Smyrna. I mean, it was a lot of persecution going on. Not good, you know, for, for the gospel. But, it, but there's a promise to every church that overcomes. Did you know that? Did you know that? And the Bible says, what overcomes in this life? Our faith. 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory. So here it is. Say, this is the victory, this is the victory. that overcomes the world. Even our faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus and what he's done. Amen? Now, these people were going through a really bad time. Really bad. And the promise to this church, the only two churches of the seven that were not rebuked, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And look at this. The other five were. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now watch this. He that overcometh, what overcomes? Our faith in what Jesus has done. Not our works, not our religious calisthenics, not all of our goodness, but our faith in his perfection. Remember, we're going into the perfection. We're building upon the foundation of Jesus and what he's done. Now watch this. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Wow. What does that mean? Does that mean they'll never die physically? No, that's not what that means. It says they won't be hurt by all the persecution they're going through. You know, there was a temptation in this situation to think God's not good. Right? Man, you're being persecuted. People are being burned at the stake. They're being slaughtered. God, if you're so good, why is all this happening? Anybody ever thought like that? Or let me bring it into our American culture. God, if you're so good, why did they look at me wrong? 
Oh, I can see that. <laughs> These people were being beheaded, burned at the stake. I don't know what was all happening. It was bad. Amen? And he says, watch this. If you overcome, you just look to me. You won't be hurt by all the junk you're going through. You may be martyred, but as soon as you're martyred, you're stepping into an awesome place. Amen? We need to have that perspective. You know, they, if they kill you, guess what? They're doing you a favor. Yeah. See, we don't think like that. And that's our problem. I'll say that again. That's our problem. We think this little vapor of a life. What does the scripture say? What is your life? James chapter 4, verse 14, I believe it is. It is a, little, it is a vapor. This life's a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Amen. C.S. Lewis said, the less you think of the next world, the greater mess you usually make of this one. Well, this is a big picture here, baby. This is awesome. We win. I love what Andrew says. He says, man, you believe God for healing, you get healed, you rub the devil's nose in it. You die, you go to be with the Lord in, in the fullness of his presence. You win there too. It's a win-win situation. Now, let me show you how people are hurt of the second death and then we'll get into eternal resurrections. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Watch this. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself took part of the same. What's that? Flesh and blood. Jesus walked this earth physically. He took part in all the temptations that you and I have taken part in and have experienced. Just the temptation to, to think God's bad, the tempt, well, you know, all the different things. Jesus had all those human emotions when he walked the earth. Did you know that? It says, took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Woo! See, the devil's been judged. We'll get to that. That he, he might destroy him or unemploy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Next verse. See, you know, the only power the devil has is what you and I give him. The only power he has is what other people give him. Let me give you an example. People say, oh man, all them gay spirits just congregated over San Francisco and then, then all these gay people moved out there. So you 49er fans, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> but, but, but that's not how it is. Spirits don't congregate over an area and then people come there. Spirits live through people. The power man gives them. Amen? That's powerful. And, what, and deliver them. This is what Jesus did. He said, deliver them who th through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This is part of the pain of the second death. We live in bondage because we're afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid of death. Amen. For you've already died. Now, I know physically you're going to shed your body. The world will call that death. But you're just stepping over into an awesome place. See, I believe in the nowness of it all. But I'm telling you what, there's a future too. Amen. Amen. This is exciting. This is exciting. That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 on down, he started talking about, man, I have a desire. A, a, literally a lust. <laughs> See, we always hear lust in, in a negative sense. I, I'm lusting to depart and get out of this body to be with Christ. Now is Christ not with you? He is with you in your spirit. And the more you renew your mind to that, you experience his presence in your emotions and your physical situation. But you still have a mortal body that is incapable of seeing the fullness of who you are in the spirit. That's why you get a new one. Someday you're going to get a body that's going to keep up with your spirit. Glory to God. See, that's something to look forward to. See, that was the air in 2 Timothy 2 of, I believe it's Alexander and Philetus, and they were preaching a doctrine and saying the resurrection was already passed. You know what you do when you do that? You attack people's hope of the future. And they start living like, well, this is all there is. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. And Christians do the same thing. Set your affection, the Bible says in Colossians 3, on things that are above, not on things that are of this earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, wait a minute, I thought I already had him. You do in your spirit. Amen. The more you know that, the more you experience him in your experience. All right. So this is one of the facets of the second death. People in bondage all their life to the fear of death. You ever notice when you were a kid, you didn't worry about anything? Your biggest concern was, you know, your new skateboard or your go-kart or whatever you was getting. I mean, I mean, you were ate up if you didn't get that right. But then you get older and you say, oh, what was that pain? Oh, what was that? Uh, uh, nothing. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You ever notice that? Nobody noticed that. 
I can't relate either because I'm too young. <laughs> and deliver them through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Say, God has delivered me from the fear of death. One more. Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Next verse. Now that doesn't mean Christ is disconnected with you. He's in you in the person of the Holy Ghost. But he's also in heaven. You know, he's God. And he fills heaven and earth, Jeremiah 23, 24. Amen. Don't ask me how that works. <laughs> but next verse. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. Next verse. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the ages, is what the Greek says, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now remember that verse, because we're going to talk about something Jesus has judged. Next verse. And as is it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment to stop. Do you know in God's eyes you've already died? Jesus' death was your death. You will shed this mortal body. It has an expiration date. Amen? But, but you have already died in the mind of God. And you've, already, and you've been judged as far as a son of God. Now there is a judgment we'll get into. Rewards. That's a different world. Not there yet. One more verse. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. In other words, when Jesus appears physically the second time, it's not to deal with sin. Why? Because sin's already been dealt with. Amen. There's only one sin that did not go to the cross. Did you know that? I'll say it and then we'll talk about it. It's the sin of not believing on Christ. The only sin that didn't go to the cross. All other sins have been put on the cross. Amen. All right. So let's get into it. The eternal judgment. Everybody say eternal judgment. Number one, who, let's talk about all the judgments. First of all, you need to understand the devil's been judged. Woo! <laughs> the devil has been judged. Now, he his future is in the lake of fire. But the verdict has already been established. Do you know Satan used to have access to God? Did you know that? Look at Job chapter 1 verse 6. I'll show it to you. There's many verses. Satan under the old covenant had access to God. Isn't that something? He doesn't have access anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. Why did he have access? How could Satan... Watch this. And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. That's a trip. That's how could Satan come? Jude, uh, uh, Job 2.1 says the same, basically the same thing. How could Satan come with the sons of God and appear before God? You ever wonder that? How did he have that right? Who gave him that right? Anybody know? Adam. Adam was, Adam, that was Adam's place. But when Adam fell, Satan had legal access to God. Now you know why. Hebrews, or excuse me, Luke 10, 18, look at this. Look at Luke chapter uh, 10, verse 18. Man, I love this screen. And he said, Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Glory to God. Satan's been booted out, baby. That's why he goes through the earth accusing the brethren. How does he accuse them? One of his primary ways is pulpits. <laughs> he uses pulpits to accuse the brethren. You're guiltless in the eyes of God because of what Jesus has done. And if you deny or contradict that, he'll contradict you because he's going with the blood. Amen. Now, one more verse. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all. Somebody say all. The power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You know that authority has been given to you? But here's the, here's the kicker. You've got to use it. God's not going to use it independent of you. So a lot of people say, well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. No, God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But multitudes don't. But that's God's will. See, you have, say, I have the power. The authority has been given to me. But I have to use it. <laughs> Amen. If I give you the keys to the car, guess what? That's great keys, man. I really love those keys. <laughs> you got to use them. Matthew 16, Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Amen. Key, keys unlock doors. Amen. Let me give you another one. Say, Satan's been judged. Jo jump over to John chapter 12. 
John chapter number 12, verse 31. Ah, how many of these can I use? Just a couple. Now is the judgment of this world. Stop. How many people believe, well, America's going to be judged? How many bought that stupid book, The Hardinger? God's going to judge America. God's already judged America. Well, if God don't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. If God does judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Jesus. Amen. God's already judged Jesus. All, that, all of America's sin and the world's sin was put on Jesus at the cross. Amen. Well, then why are there so many bad things? Because people are going their own way. There's consequences for wrong behavior. Amen. Sorry, Jonathan Kahn. That's the guy's name who wrote the book. I'll let you hear it. Last name, Khan. <laughs> Anybody hearing it? Anybody? Amen. It's like the guy that wrote 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Take Place in 1988. Edgar Wisenut. <laughs> How's his name? I mean, you'd think people would see it. Okay, Joe Wisenut. <laughs> and Fred Khan, his brother. <laughs> it's like... I'm not, I'm not trying to demean people. That's not my goal. But I am trying to demean the false teaching that's being espoused. You know, when Y2K occurred, they, had a, they brought everybody to the edge of the cliff. Guess what happened? Nothing. Just like the Mayan calendar a couple years ago or whatever it was. It's all foolishness, people. Look at Jesus. Everybody's looking everywhere but Him. It's all about Jesus. I had an experience uh, uh, a couple days ago on the phone with a, a brother from, a Canadian brother that I that I used to be a part of the same camp that he was in. And we were talking on the phone, and, and he was telling me about all these things and this and that and the other thing. And I told my wife, I said, I kept listening for Jesus. And it was, there was no Jesus. I told Rich the same thing. It was all about their fasting and their this doing this and they're doing this. And he said, I will, I, we will meet together when this revival breaks out. See, they're, they're praying for revival to break out. Can I, let me give you a clue. Revival's here. It, when did it happen? Let's stick with the word in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, God poured out his spirit on all flesh. And now, now they have to receive it. See, the key to revival is just me having revival. <laughs> Amen. It's not waiting on God to do something. It's all done. That's why Jesus sat down, not because he was tired. Amen. Now, yes, there's coming when we'll get a glorified body and all those types of things. But, but the work's finished, man. The redemptive work is done. We just have to operate in it. See, people got this idea of revival that God's turned around like this and he's tapping his foot and people pray hard enough all of a sudden, okay, there's a little bit of revival. I'm, I'm mad. I'm taking it back. That's what people think. It's wrong. The, revival's here. Say, revival's here. Let's just have it. <laughs> Amen. Just have it yourself. You burn, people come and watch you burn. Amen. People are looking for life. You're full of the life of God. Amen. Amen. They're looking for life. It's not what it looks like on the outside. It's what's going on in the inside. If you understand that, it'll eventually change the outside. You don't have to figure it out. There's a heavy revy. All right. Now is the judgment of this world come. This is Jesus speaking. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Where was he? He had access to the throne room of God under the old covenant because Adam gave him access. To be able to accuse the brethren. That's what he came before the Lord in the book of Job. And, and the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? He can't come before the presence of the Lord. You know, why, you know who's, who's at the right hand of the Father now? You have an intercessor. Job had an accuser. <laughs> Big difference, baby. Say, I got an intercessor. A representative. Not an accuser. Man, if that... I don't light your fire, your wood's wet. Amen. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Next verse. And if I be lifted up from the earth, he's talking about, you'll see in a minute, he's talking about being crucified. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Men is italics. He'll draw all judgment unto him. That's the subject. Yes, in a sense, you could say he made salvation available to all men because all that judgment that men deserve was drawn to him but they have to receive it. Next, one more verse. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Revelation chapter 12. Wow, where does time go? Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. 
and I'll go to about verse... I'll go somewhere. <laughs> 7, 7 11. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Next verse. And he prevailed not. The dragon prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. There's no place for the enemy in heaven. All that's up is Jesus, and he's interceding or representing you, and he's saying, guiltless. Praise God. Amen. He's. Now I love this. Their place was not found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Next verse. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come. Does this sound like John 12? Well, it can't be John 12 because what how I mean, I'm not going to say be nice Chris what they told me is that Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 was the church being called out and so the rest of the book of Revelation really doesn't apply to us because we're not even here foolishness I used to believe it too it's not what it's saying does this sound like John chapter 12 or not does now did he use now over there too yes he did it's the same event Jesus is talking about what his redemptive work did the book of Revelation is about redemption, not about what's going on in the Middle East. Amen. Hallelujah. I have to say that because people, ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, and look at this. Now has come. Why? What, what has come? Because the enemy was cast out from that place of accusation. Amen. That, when Jesus went to heaven, the Bible says he offered with his blood. What was he doing? Cleansing the very spot that Satan used to stand and accuse the brethren. Now, watch this. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Do you know under the old covenant, Satan was before God day and night accusing people? That's why they were, they were so sin conscious. They had to constantly offer sacrifices for sin. But in the new covenant, Hebrews 10, verse 1 on down says, we're to have no more conscience of sin. But yet people get up, well, what are you preaching on? Sin. I remember one preacher, I heard of him, he goes, I'm, he was a skinner. What's a skinner? I skin him. No, you're an idiot. <laughs> I say that in love. <laughs> well, look at this. He accused them before God day and night. This is, when, this is what he's talking about in Luke 10 and John 12. Satan's been kicked out, baby. Say glory. But now he goes through the earth as a roaring lion, barking at you, accusing you, you're sorry, you're messed up, you're beat up, you're horrible, you're bad, you can't expect to be blessed by God. You, how do you expect God to show up when you spend time praying and worshiping Him? He's already there, first of all. You don't have to get Him to show up. But eventually your senses will realize He's already there. <laughs> and you'll say, well, the presence of God came. No, the presence of God's already here. Amen. Next, one more verse. And they overcame Him. Oh, I love this. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now watch this. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb Amen. and the word of their testimony. Yes, there it is. Oh, it was so hard, and I just held on, and God, God was there. That's not the testimony he's talking about. Amen. Revelation 19.10. Watch this. We'll show you the testimony. Here's the testimony. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Revelation 19, 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony. Of who? Thank you. Thank you. So everybody say with me, Satan's been judged. And in his eventual judgment, he will be cast into the lake of fire. And that's the ultimate second death, according to Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15, where it says death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. Okay? Now, I, I, that's moving right along. So the devil's judge. Next one, judgment. We're talking about eternal judgment. Judgment on a religious system, or as I like to say, a Babylonian system. What does that mean? Uh, let me think here. Where do I want to start? Go to... 
I'm debating. Go to, yeah, just go to, um, well, I'll just start with John 3.36, and then we'll go to Revelation 18. I got so many verses. John 3.36. It's been judgment on a system. He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life. Amen. If you believe on the Son of God, you're not trying to get everlasting life. You've already got it. Yeah. All right? And he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Does that mean God's judging him? No. God's already judged a, a Babylonian, mixed up, confused religious system. There's a judgment on this world right now for rejecting Christ. John chapter 12, watch this one, verses 47 and 48. I want you to see this one. I think that's it. John chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. Watch this. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. This is Jesus talking. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. One more verse. He that rejecteth me, Jesus, and receiveth not my words, has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So people are already under a judgment if they reject Christ. Why? Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you understand that you're in Christ, all that judgment's been put on Jesus. All the recompense for your sin has been put on Jesus. Amen. That's good news. Revelation 18. Uh, I'll just do verse 4. I will just do verse 4. Amen. Judgment on a Babylonian system, a confused religious system. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. Who is her? Who is her? Mystery Babylon. Babylon means confusion and it means mixture. And God's talking to his people. Say, his people. Are you one of his people? God's saying, Come out of her, my people. My people, my people, my people, come out of religious confusion that mixes law and grace. My people, why? That you receive or that you be not partakers of her sins. You're not going to ever partake of your sins because your sins were judged at the cross. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that doesn't mean there's not consequences for wrong behavior. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying God has taken the judgment that you and I deserve and it was nailed at the cross. That's why Colossians chapter 2 verses uh, 14, 15 right in there talks about God took the handwriting of requirements that requirements the new King James says out of the way and he nailed it to his cross and he stamped in his blood paid in full. That's good news. Now watch this. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, mystery Babylon, confusion, mixture, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. So the judgment on a system, if I persist in a system that tells me it's about him, there's a judgment. It's not God saying, Well, I'm mad at you now. God's not mad at me. Amen. Well, what you don't know won't hurt you. What you don't know could be killing you. <laughs> Amen. All right, moving right along. So judgment on a Babylonian system. Here's the one. I love this one. I shared some of it with you already. Judgment on sin. You know sin's already been judged. Amen. Let me show it to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 we'll start with. Romans 8, 1. Watch this. And we're talking about eternal judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation or threat of punishment to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I know that's been added, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. Next verse. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, keep this up there, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from what? The law of sin and death. What's that? You sin, consequences, death. That's the law of sin and death. You sin, death. So the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, where he took what we deserved, has set me free from the law of, if I sin, there's death. Whew. Glory to God. And I'll tell you what. Somebody get this. Man, we should be hanging from the, whatever them things are. <laughs> Ceiling fans. Next verse. Watch this. Here's what I'm after. For what the law could not do, the law could never produce this. Not because the law wasn't perfect, it was perfect. But man was not. For the, what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh. 
God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned us in the... Condemned what? Condemned sin in the flesh. So guess what's been judged? Sin. Eternal judgment. What's been judged? You know, sin's been judged. Amen. <laughs> you know, I heard um, a story one time about a preacher who used to get up and he'd pound the pulpit. He'd say, sin's got to be judged. Sin's got to be judged. The good news is sin has been judged. Amen. See, it's eternal judgment. God condemns sin in the flesh, not you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Somebody say amen. If you condemn something, like if you, if you say you condemn a building, what are you saying? No longer fit for use. See, believers that are living with a condemnation mindset believe that God can't use them because they know their imperfections. See, Christianity isn't about believing in my imperfections or, or, or anything. It's about believing in Jesus' perfection. For by one offering, Hebrews 10, 14, He has perfected forever those who are sanctified. God looks at you and sees perfect because you're in His Son. Not because you're perfect, but because He's perfect and you're imperfect. <laughs> so sin has been judged. And I showed you that out of Hebrews 9, verses 24 through 28. Wow, Jesus was judged in our place. We talked about that. That's another thing. We have already been judged uh, for sin and been uh, accounted as sons and daughters. Another judgment, judgment number five, is we need to judge ourselves. Oh, there you go. I knew the other shoe would drop. We need to judge ourselves. We do, but what do we judge? Anybody know? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 from the Amplified, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. We do need to judge ourselves. But what do we need to judge ourselves of? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourself in the King James. Prove your own selves. Know ye not, I'll, let's do it from the Amplified. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourselves, not Christ. Do you not yourselves realize and know through, thoroughly by an ever-increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you are counterfeit, disapproved on trial and rejection. Here's what it's simply saying. Test yourselves to make sure your faith is in Him. Go, go to 1 Corinthians 11.31. King James, please. It's all so good. Now, how do you do that? I'm going to give you a quick little synopsis here of how you do that. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Judge what? This is where he's talking about the communion table here. If I would judge myself and make sure I'm looking at the sacrifice of Jesus and what he did, I would not fall under the same condemning sentence that the world falls under. Can you hear that? You know, most people don't judge themselves to make sure their faith is in Jesus. And if you don't do that, your faith automatically gravitates back to you. Come on. It's a fight to keep your faith in Jesus. Did you know that? It's a fight to keep your faith in Jesus. It's called the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. And it says, lay hold upon eternal life. Lay hold, it means seize upon eternal life. Eternal life, according to John 17, verse 3, is knowing Him. It's a fight. In fact, the word where it says, fight the good fight of faith, you know what it means? Anybody know? It's where we get our English word, agony. This is a fight, man. Most, most people aren't going to take... See, preachers can control people. And I'm not saying they do it intentionally. I think most people just parrot what they hear. But, but, but many, you can, they try to control people by putting them under fear and guilt. And kind of, see, and people, you know why people relate to that? Because they don't understand the new covenant. Amen? Jesus came and condemned sin in the flesh, not you. In fact, in John chapter 3, verse 17, he says, you know, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Jesus didn't come to the earth and you sorry thing there, you sorry. He came so the world could be saved. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. I'll try this one. We're going to have to end. The beepers already went off. I just love this. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, much more, being reconciled or brought back to God. We shall be saved by His life. 
But in the church world, it isn't much more. It's much less. Now that you're saved, God's going to burn your barley fields if you're not. Ah, ah, then. <laughs> it's the truth. It's not much more. It's much less. And that's wrong. The scripture says much more. If we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled should I expect the blessing of God because of what Jesus has done. Amen. Glory to God. Everybody say much more. Much more. The next verse. Where did, I got to quit. We're not done. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. It's not a good word. It's, the only, it's in the King James. It should be reconciliation. We have now received all the benefits of what Jesus has done. Everybody say much more. Much more. Hallelujah. Not much less. Man, I got, people get saved. They come just as they am. Just as you are. And they sing that song. And then it's just as you better be. And you better try harder. And you better do more. And you better... And too many pizza. I can't even remember all this, let alone do it. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. I hate religion. Religion's a killer. And it's all over the body of Christ. It's all over the body of Christ. It had me bound for years. And now there's other things coming, other deceptions coming, uh, deceiving people. But thank God, we're not going to fall for it. Uh, we're not. Because we're staying right here and He will show us. Amen. It's so good. Golly, it's good. And I got to stop. Man. <laughs> All right. All right. I, want, I want to talk to you, and I will finish with this. I'm going to talk to you about two more things. Future judgment and discernment or versus judgment. I want to talk to you about those two things, then we'll, we'll burst into a new one. There is a future judgment, even for the believer. But listen to me, guys. It's not a judgment for sin. It's already been done. It's a judgment of rewards. The Bema seat. And that's awesome. Even what that word means is awesome. It's awesome. What you do with what he's given you will be greatly rewarded. Amen. Amen. I think Paul was so excited. He said, I fought the fight. I finished my course. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown. Not for me only, but also for all those who love is appearing. There's laid up for me a crown. I don't know what that all consists of, but you know what? Just to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did with what I gave you. I like what Greg Moore says. He says, I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. Not well. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But see, there's no sin.